Today is part of our ongoing project, uh, talking leadership conversations with powerful women. We're interviewing lawyer, activist, and women's movement icon, Sarah Weddington. In these conversations, we're exploring the lives and the views of some extraordinary women who have changed the world. In the last decades of the 20th century, we know that there were a number of them who have really transformed the landscape for women as well as for men. Sarah Weddington, there's no way to talk about your many leadership contributions over the past 30 years without discussing the event that brought you first to public attention. And that, of course, was the time in the early 1970s, culminating in the famous Supreme Court decision of Roe versus Wade. January 1973, the court handed down that famous 7-2 to two decision. As the lawyer who successfully defended Jane Roe before the highest court of the land, you skyrocketed to national prominence in that case, and you changed history. You were then in your mid-twenties, fresh out of law school. Now, we aren't going to be talking in detail here about the case, partly because you've already recounted it in your superb memoir, A Question of Choice, which I urge all of our viewers to go right out and get it. I haven't read it already. But even at the time you wrote that book, nearly 20 years afterwards, you pointed out in the book that you were quite surprised that there was such a debate still going on about abortion. And even now, 30 years later, indeed in the 30th year anniversary of that case, abortion and stands on abortion remain a litmus test for candidates, for appointees, really across the land in some ways more than ever. And of course, we're talking now about the decision continuing to be endangered. We're talking about the plans for a big march in April of 2004. So the first thing I'd like you to reflect upon all these years later is the incredible staying power of this issue of abortion with the American people. What is it about abortion and this country, since it hasn't been an issue uh, in many other countries around the world, and to the extent that it's becoming one, it's sort of an exported American product. What is it about the United States that continues to be fixated on this issue? Well, I think there are a number of things. One is that Roe versus Wade was such fundamental change in the sense of the options women had. Um, let me go back and come forward. Um, just in March, Time Magazine, which was having its 80th anniversary, did a special issue called 80 Days That Changed the World. And they called and said, we'd like for you to write a piece on Roe versus Wade because that's the date we've cho chosen for 1973. Now, it got shorter and shorter because the war was getting closer and closer, but I, there is a small piece. And I have a collection of ancient buttons, and mm -hmm. one of them was the button a lot of people would remember that has red around the outside and a slash across it and a coat hanger in the middle. And I wear my buttons from time to time, and I had on that one on a plane not long before that. A flight attendant kept looking at the button, and she'd go on by, and she'd come back and she'd look at it again and she'd go by and finally she stopped and she said what do you have against coat hangers and i had to explain the history of the button and how that meant no more back alley no more coat hanger abortions i think part of the reason it has been such a lasting issue is that what people experienced as the reality of trying to get access to contraception which was not readily available in the 1960s, or certainly trying to get access to options relating to an unplanned pregnancy, which was very much the case in the 60s and 70s. People's, people of, that gen of my generation remember those issues and resonate to them because everybody knows a horror story. Today, nobody knows a horror story because the truth is, except for those who may be very young or very poor, if you decide you want an abortion, there is a good, safe, legal place for you to go at a very reasonable cost. On the other hand, I think the opposition has become much more energized 
Um, I see that in terms of their organizational strength. Um, sometimes, for example, having fundamental churches in the part of the country I'm from, Texas, where uh, there are various petitions available outside the church for people to sign. Uh, there are various uh, activities where the leader in the church is talking about needing to change the law. Uh, those churches that are pro-choice don't tend to talk about it in the same way. So I think part of it is you have this adamant uh, group of people who are pro-choice, not pro-abortion, but pro-choice, saying it's my right to make that decision, nobody else should make it. They don't talk a lot about it, but they certainly are adamant that that's the way it's supposed to be and they vote in that way. And then you have a larger, a large group, larger than it's been in the past, that is more organizationally strong, that tends to have more money put into its organization. Now they have uh, just about all the top uh, offices in Washington, with Bush having first said that he was not, let's see, his exact wording I think was that he believed, he was opposed to abortion, he believed in a constitutional amendment to prohibit it, but the American public wasn't ready for that. But then he put in as Attorney General John Ashcroft, who in prior years as a U.S. Mm -hmm. Senator had said if there was one thing he could do in public life, it would be to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, so there are lots of people in the administration that have long histories as very much opposed to abortion, some as opposed to contraception. Um, and so you get this clash where the forces aren't equal, but they are both intense. They have a lot of numbers, and they move large numbers of people in elections and in public kinds of controversies. So I do think it continues to be probably the central issue that primarily affects women that is going to be a focus in every election coming up for quite some time, I and, think. And you don't think that <laughs> the uh, new technologies, the pill, are you yeah. 486, and the various other technologies will simply just make it obsolete, and the issue will, as a political issue, will have to die. Uh, Ruth, I wish I could say yes, but I'm not seeing that at all. And in fact, what we now see are various proposals in Washington that would basically say life begins at conception, and there is there just recently is be, being an increased attack on the availability of RU-46. The, uh, emergency contraception. There's now an increased opposition uh, by those who say life begins at conception to even being able to have available emergency contraception. Uh, you've got the issue of what would happen with the U.S. Supreme Court uh, because certainly Stevens, who is the oldest in his 80s, um, has been very much on the side of Roe versus Wade and at some point he'll be leaving. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, who's been the leader of the middle faction, uh, has, according to rumors from time to time, said she's thinking about when her term would end, or her tenure. Uh, I don't think she's going before the next election, but I think she's looking at that. You have Rehnquist, Chief Justice, who is the leader of those opposed to abortion being legal. Um, and there have been rumors about him. I don't think it's going to happen in the next several weeks or months. But I do think you've got the key players in each of the three segments of the Supreme Court that are thinking about leaving. And so clearly either this president or whoever's elected for the next term is going to have some major Supreme Court appointments that really could decide what the fate of availability of abortion, which is what's most under attack right now, and what the future legality of abortion would be. Do you think it would radicalize, I mean, the, you know, the kind of in, instantaneous responses will do that, you know, just like reinstituting the draft. If Absolutely. you want to talk about radicalizing young people and yeah. making them politically active, do right. you think that would radicalize young Absolutely, women? Absolutely, you because do. young women are so used to having the ability to make their own decisions. And while they've heard lots of talk and they hear various kinds, they really don't believe that anything could take away their right to make that decision, which is, I think, one of the reasons why Bush phrased it that way. I'm opposed to abortion. I am for a constitutional amendment. Therefore, all of you who are opposed know that I'm your guy. Mm -hmm. But the American public aren't ready with it. So don't the rest of you be afraid of me. Mm -hmm. So I do think that what they're trying to do right now is 
things that make it much more difficult for women in other countries, they don't vote here, that make it much more difficult for people who are younger. They're very mixed feeling. I mean, what they're really doing at this point is aiming at the constituencies that um, are the, the less politically influential and trying to keep people from realizing how much of a groundwork they're laying to attack Roe. Returning to your characterization of the polarized groups in this country, I was fascinated to be reminded in your book that it was the liberal religious organizations that got together early on in support um, of Roe and of, of uh, abortion rights. Um, what would you say about the role of organized religion at this stage? It seems for most people who are looking at the issue, the right has taken over and the fundamentalists as you describe it are the ones that are calling the shots right now. How, if I may put it, sincere mm -hmm. is all of this? And why do you think that it becomes the issue. Is it underneath something else? Is it concern about women's roles generally that makes abortion the thing to, to get a handle on? Or why do you think in this country where in yeah. many ways women have acquired so many more freedoms and so many more rights mm -hmm. that this has become such a sticking point? You mean women's self-determination at some very basic level yeah. is the fear? Is I'm yeah. I, I, when I look at it, I wonder if that isn't it for a number of the antis. You know, it's um, so hard to say because there are so many different versions of being right. anti. But certainly if you look at a certain evangelical preacher well known in this country who said that one of the last hurricanes was uh, brought here or because we, were, we have become a godless country, we allow abortion. Uh, I mean, there's some really ridiculous things that are said. But I also think that there are some people who are very sincere in saying they really believe life begins at conception. And so I think you can get this one point of view that looks primarily at the fetus and the woman is not seen. If you think about their posters, if you think about the pictures they show, the rhetoric, the woman is totally not there. Whereas I must admit, I focus more on the woman. What is her life? What is her future? What are her hopes? What will happen to her? What about her? responsibility with or without a partner to raise this child well. Uh, and so I think our focuses are very different. And um, I do sometimes think about the people I see outside the clinics picketing because they tend to be uh, older white males who I think have a very traditional view of what women are supposed to be doing and they can stand out there, it is the only place they can really yell at women and be absolutely awful to them and feel godly for doing it. Uh, it is the only place where you can go out and say, here's what you ought to do with your life, but then have no responsibility for trying to help. Um, you know, in Texas, we have seen a lot of that rhetoric, but we're cutting children's health insurance provisions. We are cutting uh, all kinds of benefits that are for children. So we hear the rhetoric about, you know, this child has got to be born, but then once the child is born, we are not seeing the policies that would really make education, health care, support of all kinds available for kids. Let me use that as a, a way actually to move us into the uh, issue of women's leadership, which we we'd love to spend some time talking about. Uh, certainly women's leadership with regard to uh, public policies and the kinds of issues you're now talking about has been a great interest of yours, of mine, all of us for a long time. Um, I noticed uh, that your webpage is uh, the Weddington Center for Leadership and so the conceptualization of leadership as a key way of looking at what's happening and what we can contribute, I know is very important to you. You've spent a lifetime being a leader and you've spent a lifetime observing leadership and the lack thereof and have also been part of this whole era in which change for women has meant new opportunities for aspirations that were traditionally denied to them. How well do you think we've done on this leadership issue, whether we're talking about positions, bringing women along, um, whether we've, we're talking about how women think about leadership, um, the message that we're sending? 
Are you satisfied um, with what you think, with where we are and no, what we've No, of course done? not. <laughs> well, I, but, okay, let me look back. Yeah. I think of it in various pots. Uh, one is the laws that are discriminatory. And frankly, we have made wonderful progress in that regard. You know, when I came along, women, if they became pregnant as public school teachers, were told either they had to quit or they'd be fired. And so it was in the 70s that we were passing the laws that said you can't fire women simply for being pregnant as public school teachers. It was that period where women were told you've got to get your husband's signature in order to get credit cards. And it was the 70s we passed laws that said you can't do that. Rape in that period, often state law said you have to resist to the maximum extent possible, but the police were saying don't resist, you'll get hurt. And the whole issue of the woman's character being the focus of the trial, and we changed that in the 70s. It was in the late 70s when Carter, Jimmy Carter, was president that we funded the first domestic violence shelters. It was in that period we started expanding opportunities for women in military. Uh, when Carter became president, women could not fly because all flying was considered combat. And it was that period we changed it administratively so women could fly troop transport, reconnaissance, refueling, a whole series of things, and then started the pieces that have led to the expanded role for women. It was uh, during that period that we passed. So I think of the 70s as legislation, and there are very few, I can't really specifically name something, that as in the old days, says women do this and men do this, right. and it's different. The second thing we really started working on then was much more employment. Um, you know, originally Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was meant only for men. And it was a Southern Senator, Howard Smith is I think the name, mm -hmm. um, right. who to defeat the bill put in and not on the basis of sex. Uh, but then it was a huge fight to get the EEOC to look at employment in regard to sex. And then we had um, you know, the whole issue of what is sexual harassment on employment, quid pro quo, I'll do this if you'll do that, or hostile environment. So I think the 80s were a time when we were really expanding more in economic fields and you know, changing the social security laws, uh, now changing IRA so women whether they work outside the home or inside the home, can have their own IRA. There are lots of economic issues that came in the 80s, and then beginning to change attitudes. What I think we're now really trying to focus on in the 90s and into the 2000s is this whole issue of why are there so few women in leadership positions? And that has not dramatically changed in this period. There are certainly more. But the change has not been very dramatic. If you look at elected leadership, if you look at the number of women who run business, major corporations, if you look at the women who run major educational opportunities. And so it's this how do we, a lot of the, what I will call the infrastructure has been changed. Now how do we change the attitudes of those who are not women, about women, and how do we change the attitudes of women about themselves? And so we've done a lot of different things. Um, the group I'm, I've worked with in Texas is the Foundation for Women's Resources. So first we wrote a little book called um, Texas Women in Politics. It was just, um, you know, little interviews with people who were women who were doing all kinds of elected offices, trying to say to women, see, these women are doing it, you could do it too. Then we went into Leadership Texas because we thought part of what happens is women who have good leadership ability simply aren't very visible. And that what people do is they sit around and say, who do you know that would be a good dean, that would be a good this or that? And if we could have those women come to their minds, that could be helpful. And then we did Leadership America, and then we did uh, Power Pipeline, which is our version of trying to help younger women, 25 to 35, to move on up. And then we did the Women's Museum. So the Women's Museum in Dallas was done because there wasn't a single museum that just focused on women. Now there's some others that are beginning to open up, but that was the first. And there we were trying to just show people the various ways in which women had been leaders. Uh, and then trying to look at how do we as individuals increase our own leadership. So I think 
you know, for me as a person, I'm, I'm still struggling with how do I expand my leadership? How do I become the best leader I can be? What is the best use of my time and energies? Uh, and then how do I translate that for other people? Yeah, it's um, for those of us who came out of uh, that wonderful period you're describing in the 70s when it feels as if we did in fact turn the world upside down and uh, those changes I think are there forever and uh, our young st students don't even realize to what extent uh, their lives, their potential has been forever changed. Um, but some people emerged in that period, you're a shining example, as major leaders. Um, would you describe your leadership as accidental leadership, deliberate leadership? And when you talk about working on attitudes now, you know, that we've got to find ways to change the attitudes of young women about leadership for themselves. Um, how do you think about your own life and your own leadership in terms of how it got there? Well, I think mine, um, you know, I look back on how, I mean, in the book, you all talk, in your book mm -hmm. about talking leadership, uh, you all talk a lot about histories of people. You know, my father is a Methodist minister. Uh, that meant we had to move every four years because that's the way the Methodists do it. So every church has the best talent of all of the ministers in a certain area. So I got used to having to meet people and feel comfortable meeting strangers. Uh, second, it was one of those things where I always did the church devotional, always played the piano, always, you know, was a leader in the very traditional church route. And people were very kind and they always said, oh, you're so good, you're so wonderful. And I don't know if I was or wasn't, but those words helped give me the confidence to do it again. Um, and so I was the drum major for the Canyon Junior High Band. Not the drum major. I mean, not the cheerleader or the twirler, but I was the drum major. Then I was the, I was the president of the Future Homemakers of America, of Canyon High School. It's the only thing women could be president of at the time. Then I became secretary of the student body in college, secretary of my law class. At a time, women were just never the president or vice president as they are today. So I think there were some things about how I grew up in leadership. It's why I really encourage younger women to practice leadership. Because I learned so many skills and some self-confidence in that way. So that by college I was doing debate and extemporaneous speaking and the kinds of speech skills that have really been very helpful for me. But I think we were also at that time when people often said, Women don't, women can't, women shouldn't. And there was a critical mass at that point of women who said, yes, we can, yes, we will. And so in my own case, I had, I had gotten an undergraduate degree in English and speech secondary education and tried to make eighth graders love Beowulf. And that was the moment when I understood I should go to graduate school. <laughs> and I didn't have enough chemistry for medical school, didn't know what I'd do with a doctorate in English except teach, and I had not really understood I loved teaching college, but eighth grade was not where I was meant to be. Um, and so I decided I'd go to law school. Went to the dean of the college and said, I want to go to law school. And he said, well, you can't. And I said, why not? I have very good grades. And he said, my son's in law school. It would just be too tough. And of course, that was the moment I decided I was going to law school. And I call it resistance training. That it was a period when there was so much resistance to women doing all kinds of things. But like uh, people who go to gyms now, we've learned that if you come up against resistance, you get stronger. And I think we came up against a lot of resistance, but the result was we got stronger and there were enough other women experiencing the same thing. Small numbers of us, now it was never the majority, but there were enough and we were bright, hardworking, talented, well-educated, and frankly, nobody wanted me in terms of the jobs. You know, the law firms didn't want me, and so I had all this effort to pour into women's issues. So today I think it's partly that young women don't hit that kind of discrimination until they're out of college, and they're in their first jobs. And then I have my former students calling me and saying, oh, I had one last week who's now on the uh, floor of the Chicago Stock Exchange, who was calling and saying, Sarah, 
let me tell you what they're doing here. And she's saying, why is this happening? And I can just remember that question so much in the past. What were they why? doing? Not giving her opportunities? Oh, or? Uh, comments and mm, uh. little asides and all kinds of things that made it uncomfortable. And it was a power relationship, which we understood mm -hmm. from the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I think women hit the discrimination a little later now. They're not in a place they can as easily form this real uh, big group. And second, they can become so many things that they're worried about what are they, how will what they're going to do or might think of doing impact their economic future. And that just wasn't a concern for me. So I think the times have changed for the best. But there's still some reasons why their response to those kinds of issues emotionally comes a little later and maybe a little more muted. I think the discrimination, I mean, it's like when I was at work and when I was interviewing for jobs and people would say, well, you know, women who get pregnant can't whatever. Well, no employer would now talk about a woman getting pregnant. Now, they may consider it, but they'll never say it because they know that would bring a lawsuit. So I think the discrimination is to some extent more subtle. Uh, but I do think they're interested in leadership and that we're beginning to look at a lot of ways. How do we encourage young women to see leadership as part of their future? Talk to us a little bit more about just that. You were saying earlier, you know, one of the things now, having achieved what you've achieved and being very much involved in a public figure, you still have difficulties determining, well, how should I spend my time? What should I do next? And in particular, because of the very reasons that you've outlined here, what sorts of strategies strike you now in 2003 is the kinds of things that are worth pursuing that haven't been done before. The issues are different. They're more complex. The discrimination is subtler, as you've suggested. Do you have a sense of strategies that we need to consider? Well, I, I don't think I have the answers, but it's certainly something I'm actively thinking about and talking to others about. The first thing we're trying to do is actively reach out to younger women. Uh, I'll never forget, I was talking to a young woman a couple of years ago, and she said, Sarah, I really want to help, but there's no room for me. And I got to thinking about the people who are the primary movers in so many different ways on women's issues, and they're my generation. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there are ways we need to open it up for younger women. Uh, Planned Parenthoods are doing that, different names in different places, but it's trying to look at those people in their 20s and 30s to teach them what Planned Parenthood is about and how they can support it and do a lot of things. There are going to be a lot of efforts this coming year on getting younger people, uh, but I think there'll be a determined effort toward younger women in terms of voting, in terms of the election issues. And we see more, I see, at the University of Texas, and I'm told it's true across the nation, there's a lot more interest this year in politics and supporting various candidates. Um, I think part of it is, is um, having some role models. I mean, we talk about mentoring, and I don't think mentoring has to be one-on-one, -on -one, but I think if you can expose younger women to all kinds of women who are leaders but who have different styles, which is part of my trying to say to them, there is no one way to be a woman leader. There are different ways. And what you have to do is find the issue that really, that your heart resonates to. And then I try to say to my students and to others, you don't have to find your issue in college. I think you should be open to finding it. I think you should be open to issues that really make you passionate. But the truth is, if you will learn leadership, you may find the issue later. And there are lots of people who've had a, a medical experience or whose family has been involved in an issue or whose neighborhood suddenly discovers something is going to be built in the neighborhood that diminishes it, that a lot of times issues will come to you if you have just developed those leadership skills. You know, uh, when we think about women's leadership and specifically women in politics, and certainly you've been, among many things in your life, you've been a political woman all your life. You were elected to the legislature, so you served at the state level. You were appointed to President Carter's administration. You served in Washington. I know you said that you enjoyed those years very much and that experience very exciting. Uh, obviously, you have been and continue to be a major leader in advocacy um, for an issue. 
Um, so you've been a political woman all your life, and you know that uh, we've been watching the changes for women in politics and tracking them, counting the numbers. Uh, and we all go back about 30 years in this. Would you have believed in uh, 72, around the time the Women's Political Caucus was established, or in 73, the Roe period, or in 77 in Houston when we had the National Women's Conference? Um, would you have believed that in 2003, as we head into a presidential election, that we would not have seen a woman run for president or win the presidency yet? Is that <laughs> surprising? I get surprise. that question all the time. Yeah. It's, is it as surprising to you as? It is, because several, yeah. say 10, 15 years ago, I always said, well, I thought there would be a woman president before the turn of the century, yeah. and I was clearly wrong about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think part of the reason I thought that might be true is I saw how talented women were. You know, there were such good women in politics whose um, ethical behavior was so good, who I, I really, I still believe, went into politics much more for issues that related to their children mm -hmm. or the environment or bigger issues where my own experience in politics was that I ran across a number of men who I thought were primarily in politics for their own ego gratification because they got to go to the neat places and everybody paid attention to them. And, um, some of them were for issues, but I thought it was a far less percentage. So there were just so many good things about women in politics. Uh, and I thought with more education, with, uh, you know, because I always had a lot of young women who worked in my office uh, as volunteers, as interns, that the more that happened, the more they would as I did, I mean, I was a clerk typist for the Texas legislature. And when I wasn't doing my official duties, I was out watching the legislature, and I thought I could do that, and hopefully better uh, than I was seeing it. So I just thought all of that would combine. And I guess what's happened in my, to me, I think part of what's happened is politics has become such a high money game, that the money it takes to run is just, I mean, I finished my original election and a runoff for $17,000 and had not one penny of debt the day I was elected. Uh, that's just, I mean, that's almost a day or two in the life of most campaigns now. So I think the money has had a very negative influence. Now, you've certainly had Emily's list. You've had the wish list in the Republican uh, environment. You've had uh, some states that are now starting funds trying to help focus on women candidates. But we're a long way behind uh, what's available in some other races. So I think the money is part of the impediment now. What, what do you think about this statistic that uh, I mentioned to you before uh, when we were chatting uh, that came out of a recent study that we've done here at the Eagleton Institute uh, counting a census of people under age 35 in the year 2002 across the country who hold elective office, uh, the people who have presumably a future in politics, because when we look at uh, the governors today and the senators and the congresspeople, we see that half of them held their first elective office before they were at uh, age 35. So it's important, it must be important for political leadership to go in at an early age. The opportunities are there. Uh, and so when we looked around the country, we found 814 young elected leaders in legislatures, in Congress, in cities with 30,000 or more population. And out of those 814, 15% were women. And that's the beginning of the 21st century. That's the future. That tells me something about what 10 and 20 years from now, the 55-year-olds, the people who are in leadership in the Congress and governor's mansions and so forth, are going to look like and 15% of them are women. They've seen Sarah Weddington. They've watched what we've done. They've had the opportunities in the offices. Uh, and it's got to be more than the money. I think it's got to be more than the money. Well, I think it is more than the money, although I, do, I still see that as the major impediment. The other thing I think is a lot of people, men and women, see politics as being so... Um, oh, all the ugly things that are said about you or your family, how difficult that is. And so I do think that some of them are deciding not to run because they're afraid of being the target. And the truth is, in leadership, there are pluses and there are minuses. And one of the costs of public leadership is you tend to be much more a target now. 
Um, I also was just at the Fortune Magazine Most Powerful Women Summit, and the woman who is the former governor of Massachusetts was talking about how uh, when she quit, she said she was quitting uh, because it was time for someone else to take the leadership, and she had had a, all this, and all, every press uh, person that wrote it up said she just had two children and family obligations are what she has to do. And yet that for men who would say, well, I have to quit being in politics for family, they would never write that. They would say, you know, it's, uh, anyway, I think there are a lot of aspects to it. But I think we're, and I don't think we can solve that one, which is, I guess, why I think that there are a lot of women who are interested in running and who would be willing to run if they felt they had the money and the support to do it. They're willing to pay the price of being a target. Uh, but um, Well, you know, one of the, the things that we have seen in our state, and I would like to talk to you a bit later about those incredible women in Texas and what they did in getting together, because we'd like a little of that in New Jersey. But one of the things that, that we've noticed in New Jersey is that we have a kind of profile like a southern state in terms of our representation of women in the legislature. On the other hand, in the corporate sector, and our institute recently did a series of interviews with women who are rising managers in corporations in several of the sectors in New Jersey where there are, um, there's a lot of activity in, in pharmacy, in the financial services area, and in the information technology area. And we discovered a couple of things that I think are quite interesting. One was that the higher the woman went, the less she liked politics, the less she was interested in being involved in politics, except for the group of African American women. Seven of the 31 were African American women. They were all actively involved in politics, and one of them said she was thinking of running for office. So I thought that was an interesting yeah. finding, and we haven't yeah. taken it any place yet, but we've, we've just had the press release on this activity. But what I'd like to ask you is, particularly with the group that you attended recently, you mentioned there were a number of corporate women involved there. Do they represent a group that in this interim, while we're waiting for these new leaders to come along that we're encouraging in various ways, these are women that already have power. Are they women who potentially could use it for other things than what they're doing right now? Well, I think potentially they could, but I don't know whether they will. And I think that's partially because American business right now is under so much pressure. Pressure to, to look at the bottom line, pressure to cut staff, pressure to interact in an international context in a way. And so it's almost as if they're, the pressures they're under where they are to perform at peak level, to move up and all, are so, again, engaging that I'm not sure they're going to be that involved in politics. Now, we do see some who are being appointed to different things, whether it's ambassador or whether it's uh, FAA head or, you know, other kinds of things. So I think some women from that world will end up being put in very top level appointments, whether at the federal or at the state level. But the most of the ones I was visiting with, I don't see them running themselves, maybe supporting other candidates or uh, being involved on some issues like trade issues. There was more talk about trade issues, uh, more talk about some of the health issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's the issues that business is facing here that, that many of the women are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you tra as you're traveling around to a meeting like that, and I know you're traveling all the time around the country to make speeches and to meet with various groups from uh, business groups to advocacy groups to campus and so forth, um, are you finding a sense that uh, women really think that they're um, trying to or in fact managing to um, add something different you know the one question about leadership oh, yeah. is always what about the numbers and yeah. there in numbers the other question is always does it make a difference because yeah. do women bring something different yeah what are you seeing on um, I'm, I, I hear a lot of conversation about that and I think the conversation is basically if women were in charge would it be different mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I still think it is a strength that many women tend to be more collaborative, tend more to look at him. I, I cannot imagine a woman, if she had been head of Enron, ending up with a situation where everyone who worked for Enron 
at least the part that went bankrupt, lost their pensions. That is unconscionable. That is awful. That is, that is so horrendous that I cannot imagine any woman ever have done, have, have, have been involved with that. So I do think they focus much more on the human relations. Now, I'll tell you, I think some women would have had to fire some employees in recent years. I don't think they would have liked it. I don't think a lot of the men liked it, but I think they would have had to, given income and, and, and expenses in a lot of different ways. So I still, I guess I want to believe that women lead differently, that women tend to be much more focused on social issues, uh, much more accustomed to trying to give others some benefit in terms of family leave. Um, and yet, if you look at the statistics, the people who are taking family leave are women. There are very few men who are taking family leave. And so I think our ideals are still there, but I think we've run into a rough reality with what the world and the world of business is right now and the pressures that are there. When Ann Richards was governor of Texas, was it different because she was a woman? It was certainly different in terms of who got appointed to different things, far more representation of women. Um, it was certainly different in terms of taking a consumer focus. Now, I think that was also partially Ann Richards as a person and the kind of people she brought with her. I think you could have a different woman governor of Texas who might not have the same focus. And she thought of herself as a feminist. So That's you have right. a woman who was also a feminist. Yeah, and who was very concerned about people. That was her focus, and that's where she came from. Since we're talking about Texas, can we go back to that network of wonderful women who got together, including yourself, and decided to do a number of things for Texas? Do you think that that was a particular moment and time, and could you talk a little bit about it? Or do you think that there's a possibility for other states as states to work across lines of different, you know, corporations and political women and women in the community and media women? Well, I think ours was um, in some ways a unique period of time because, again, it was in that period where our energies were not absorbed by other opportunities and so we made our own. I think part of it was that um, we felt different. It was different for women to want to be involved in politics and so on. Um, and so I think we banded together with other people who felt different. And I do think, in some ways, Texas is isolated uh, from the East Coast or from some other areas. And so we weren't involved in the, oh, I don't know, sometimes bickering, sometimes advances that were happening in other places. And therefore, we just decided we were going to find our own. Now, I still think there is a wonderful opportunity in a lot of states. There's a Leadership California organization. Uh, there have been some talk about forming Leadership Illinois. I don't know if they've done it, but, but I do think women are trying to find ways to reach across these boundaries of politics, of education, uh, corporations, et cetera. And so I do think you're going to see more of that because it's, and, and in fact, at the Fortune Summit, I was interested that they had purposefully made a decision that it would be a better meeting if you included some leaders from different segments. So the core was still business, but you had people from education, people from government, people from politics, people from news, because I think powerful women do want to get to know each other and find what I call synergy, uh, where their impact is greater because of their combined um, work. I think that's so important. I mean, I don't, I don't see enough of it, but I used to think that when we got to a point that we could count more than two or three women who headed major institutions, mm -hmm. and they would somehow come together, and they would see that there was a common interest in furthering leadership and furthering women by coming together. Uh, and you know, we do have women now, heads of universities, heads of major foundations. There are some high in corporations. There are certainly some high in politics. Uh, and I haven't seen as much activity of that kind of self-conscious, we are women leaders, and so let's see what we have in common that could really advance and change things. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen as much of that as I'd love to in my idealistic, I agree with you. Yeah. Well, 
Uh, just on that point, looking at these women I was talking about that we interviewed, we had middling level and then very high level women, and the high level women had a number of the problems that I associate generally with the challenges for women's lives taken care of for them. Either their children were out of the nest, mm -hmm. or they weren't married, or whatever. But they weren't dealing with these, um, the, with the double day, so to speak. The women and the middling levels, and it turned out to be, oh my gosh, you know, it, the simplest problem is the oldest problem. And I asked myself how much of this issue of women's leadership would be solved if we could somehow find a way to ensure that the women as well as the men are spending the same amount of time caring for children. Yeah. Well, it would be a huge <laughs> help because, I'm, I mean, there are just so many women who really have to struggle with that. There are also increasing numbers of men who struggle with it, but it's a much smaller number. Um, there was a statistic recently that said the men most likely to get custody of children are professors and graduate students uh, because they have often had more flexibility in picking the kids up after daycare and doing things. Um, so I think that the support network would, certainly would be a huge help, but I don't know how we're going to solve it. There's a great quote that says, um, you know, in today's world, women are still doing the majority of housework, but not all of it like they used to. Men are doing more than their fathers did, but still not half, and nobody's happy. And I think that's probably exactly where it is. And a lot of it, uh, in the, some of the young women that I see, women particularly, let's say, in their 30s now, who are, have really wonderful educations, um, are capable of all sorts of professional achievement, have chosen to get married, have chosen to start families. They're in their 30s. They're not going to wait much longer than that. And there is no way out there, there's no real support system that allows them to do all of that. And I'm not sure, by the way, that I'm not sure it's a failure in the sense that I'm not sure I can imagine what that would be. Um, many of them are not even saying, well, I wish my husband would do more of the child care or the housework. They're saying, I've chosen this because I want to experience family at the center of my life. I want to experience this and I want to spend time with these children. I think in a way it's still partisanship aside, the big elephant in the middle of the table uh, that we don't even like to talk about with our students, but they know it. Uh, when we talk about their futures and their aspirations, they say, well, I'd like to I'd like to advance in a professional uh, capacity, uh, but I also would like to have a family. And I don't know how to do that because when I look around, I don't really see that it's possible to do all of that. They're quite realistic, I think. I do too, although when you look back at the period where we were coming up, there were no options really. And so I think today you at least have some places where there's shared work arrangements or part-time work arrangements or law firms where you can choose a track that is toward partner or choose a track that is a little less demanding and has a little more family. Uh, so I think we're still struggling. I like that saying that said you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. And I use the analogy of a car, that you have a brake and you have an accelerator and you typically do not use them at the same time. But they're both very crucial. So I think the real key, though, is that my students today, I really believe, are going to have a different kind of partnership about marriage, about children, than people of years ago. And so we see, I've forgotten the statistic, but there was recently an article, I think in Time, about men who now are the primary household caregivers. Some because they lost their jobs, and it wasn't really their option, but they chose to do that. Some where they have wives who are very high earners, and again, they've decided to do that. But it, the, the article was just pointing out how things are not as settled as they were 30 years ago, where everyone just assumed there was one way to do it, whereas now there are different ways. Um, I've seen the same phenomenon you have of young women lawyers who say, I need to go ahead and have children now, and who are doing that, but who fully anticipate not necessarily coming back as partner, but that they will come back and be a judge, or they will come back into law, or that there's an assumption there that at some point they'll come back. And then it's partly because we have so many more years now. 
So you can have children have some years out and then come back and you still have a long period. Yeah, I think the combination of the lifespan issue and the issue after all that the second wave of feminism was all about and that your life has uh, made that word such a word for history, the, the word is choice. Mm -hmm. It was about abortion in Roe v. Wade, but the movement was about choice mm -hmm. in life, giving women the options and the opportunities of a wide range of choices, and therefore men as well. And that has changed. Yeah, and like a saying from Indira Gandhi, at least it's attributed to her, where she said, I have felt like a bird born in too small a cage. And so I think women have felt that way, and we've really been working hard to expand those barriers and those bars to making personal choices. Um, I've, of course, I'm introduced regularly, but several stuck out in my mind. One was at a college campus not too long ago, and the young woman who introduced me said, this is Sarah Weddington. She is historic. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I don't think of myself that way, but I can see why somebody else would. Or the second person, it was a Planned Parenthood, and it was a young woman lawyer, and she said, this is Sarah Weddington. I never met her until today but I am her daughter-in-law. Oh. And I thought how much that sense of, not that she knew me, but rather she knew there were some women lawyers who had done important cases and those kind of things. And so I think we have a lot of daughters uh, in choice uh, who really want to be able to make their own choices in a wide range of things, and hopefully they will be. I love your optimism, and sometimes, particularly when I hear stories of these women in corporations, one not long ago who said, you know, a young man who is doing wonderful work in our corporation was criticized by his boss because this young man was singled out as someone who dropped his kids off to school and the boss said, I don't know how serious he can be about this place if he's the one that's doing that kind of work. And so sometimes I think that whole upper generation just has to vanish before <laughs> the kinds of changes can happen because here are the young men who are, as you're saying, joining in on this. We don't want all these hours in the office. Let's talk a bit about your vision for the future. Um, if if you imagine uh, sitting around watching 50 years, from up here, of course, watching 50 years down the road, some students who are watching this discussion that we're having, and it's the year 2053, how does the world look? What do you think will well, happen by then? Let me, try, let me try first with what I would like to have happen. And I, I think the interdependence of the world will be much more obvious. Uh, that we came from a time when countries thought of themselves as being isolated. Certainly the U.S. is going through a period of thinking that we can be isolated. It's not possible. There, we are too close. We are too aligned in terms of economics and social issues and environmental issues and all kinds of things. So I would hope uh, that in that period of time it, it's just a given that we're part of a world and uh, we see the European community coalescing. I think probably there'll be other kinds of um, groups that will coalesce. Uh, you all are currently leading an effort to look at women in global societies and how to help uh, promote women in other cultures, but I think that there will also be international groups of women leaders who will be working together. What I really worry about is how much progress we're going to have made on some of the social issues, like health care. Yeah, I'm not seeing the pieces. Um, I've just come through breast cancer treatment, and there were eight women. We didn't know each other at all. Just happened we all got diagnosed the same time, and we were put together as a breast cancer support group um, by a, one of our local uh, breast cancer groups. One of them has now died because of a metastasis. Uh, my sister died of breast cancer before I did. But two of the eight have no health insurance. And watching them struggle with issues, I mean, I struggle with the treatment, but I know I have it available. I can afford it with the help of insurance. And for them to have to make those kinds of decisions has just been wrenching. Uh, and so I start looking at global health issues, and I don't see a system 
that I would really want to say, well, here's what we ought to do. The U.S. system has strengths, but it has weaknesses. The European system has strengths, but it has weaknesses. And I, I don't... Um, I don't see a system that's, but health care has got to be something hopefully we have solved at that point. Um, I would certainly hope that we would be at a point of saying it's the individual and let's look at the individual and what their talents are instead of being so conscious of male or female. And maybe by then we won't have as many programs directed at women, except just for the fun of getting together. Um, I hope we won't need them. But somebody asked me, what about 30 years from now, which would be the 60th anniversary of Roe versus Wade? And I said, well, I think I'll probably be sitting in the same chair, in the same office, and I'll probably be dealing with some of the same <laughs> issues, uh, and maybe still... With optimism and a smile on your face. <laughs> well, I will, because the other thing I said to them was, but in the background will be the books I have written. Now, I've only got one now, so you know that means I've got 30 years to get some more written. Tell us about the rest of the books. Well, one I want to write is a personal look at leadership. Because I started out and I wanted to write the book that would be the summary of everything about leadership. It would be the Stogdall for future generations. And, and there were st stuff is being written and comes out faster than I can read it, much less synthesize it. Most so of I it thought, is bad. A lot of it is. The leadership yeah. literature is bad. Not, we need your book. <laughs> yeah. So then I decided, well, what I'm best at is trying to put things in a reference that has to do with my learning situation, which is me. Uh, and so I want to talk about the concept of practicing leadership, that it means you don't have to be perfect. It means you can make mistakes. Uh, when Carter and I did love working for Jimmy Carter, in fact, a friend of mine has said, He's the only president that used the presidency as a stepping stone to doing more important <laughs> things. And I just love what he's done on health care in Africa mm -hmm. and all kinds of things. But uh, when I look back at that period, I learned a lot by practicing. I left the White House and went skiing mm -hmm. and took lessons because I'd never skied and finally got down from the go up now, come down on your own, finally got down and said to the instructor, I've come all the way down, I did not fall once. And the instructor said, then you'll never be any good. <laughs> and he said, the only ones who are ever good are the ones who'll go a little faster than they know how to control, but who, if they fall down, have learned how to get up. So practice to me has a concept, you don't have to be perfect. And you do take some risks, but you don't take extreme risk. Uh, there's a thing on TV now called something like extreme sports or something. Mm -hmm. That is not what I'm trying to get people to do. But it is having the sense that if you fall down, if you don't, it's not perfect, you get up. Now part of getting up to me is professional support networks and part of it's personal support networks. And I'm talking more to people about thinking through those networks that you need and how to form them and then how to keep them intact. But I think practice is important. Second is the use of the critical eye. And by that I mean that there is no one way to be a leader. But what I've learned is watching other people. And I see somebody do something really well and I think, I want to be like that. Or I want to do it like that. Or, or uh, when I was a young lawyer, I was working with a group of senior lawyers. And one was a man from Little Rock named Ed Wright. Great trial lawyer. And I was the youngest one of the group. And when I would come up to the group, which was all men except for me, Ed would just say, now, Sarah, you haven't tried a case like this, but you will. And let me tell you, but just by mentioning my name made me feel so included. And it was one of those times I liked something, and I do it myself now because I learned using the critical eye. And then I, so there are a lot of lessons I've learned. And then I want to talk about leadership. And there's so many definitions, as you point out in your book. Uh, but the one I want to use is that leadership is the willingness to leave your thumbprint. And that can be in huge ways and it can be in smaller ways. But it is that willingness to say, I care about this, I want to change it, I want to improve it, I want to quit something, uh, and to leave that thumbprint. I was at the same Fortune uh, meeting, there was a luncheon and the focus was smoking and how to keep younger people from going into smoking. And I thought that was a really worthwhile thing that some people have said, we want to leave our thumbprint and this is the way we want to do it. Uh, so I think it's finding that something that you want to have an impact. 
And that's why for me, I think writing is part of what I want to do. I, I do think travel has become so tiring and onerous. Uh, now, it may be pretty soon we'll be able to uh, just have the thing where you look at your computer and there's that little camera on it and you talk to everybody that way. Now, I'd like that. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, for me, it's going to be as the next several years go by, staying in Austin a little bit more so I can get more of the writing done. You know, uh, of course, writing is the way, at least through the ages we're aware of, to make that thumbprint mm -hmm. last longer and longer. And I, I just uh, want to thank you very much for being willing to sit with us and talk. And I hope to have many more conversations in these next 30 years about what you're writing about. But I don't want to end this one without saying that you've already left your thumbprint. So you're going to be someone who manages to leave a couple of thumbprints. Yeah, and that's what, you know, the nice thing is, it, while it's controversial, I don't have to worry about leaving a thumbprint. I certainly <laughs> have done that. But it's also true, you don't want to do the peak of your career at 27. You want to have other things to add. And so that's the current challenge that I'm working on. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's been a delight to be with you. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful. Well, oh, Mary, it's always nice to see you and Ruth. Y'all have been leaders for a long time, so we just follow in your wake. Three thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs>